And so this morning, we're going to do something, um, I don't know that it's different, because I feel like I say that every month. It's, uh, you might look at this and go, why, why, why am I here? Um, but one of the things that I want to stress this morning is that the heart of the gospel, and guys, like, there's so much liberty if we can just take this message from God and really drill it down deep in our bones, But at the heart of the gospel, you have a God who comes to you and says, you cannot measure up to my perfections. You can't. If you could, would you want to worship a God that you could be worthy of? Like if God was like, oh, thank God, Sam's on my team. Like, he's not worthy of worship, right? (laughs) But the reality is, is we serve a God who is so amazing and so holy and so transcendent that we can never be worthy of him to try to be worthy of him is only going to be a fool's errand and it's going to make us wake up every day going oh my gosh I got to be better 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 and that's like it's good to have that motivation to be better but it's awful to have that motivation motivation to be better and have it be a fool's errand that you can never live up to I got to be a better husband, got to be a better husband, can't fail like that again, can't fail like that again. As a father, as a co-worker, as a, you just wake up every morning going, man, I disappointed myself again, I disappointed myself again, and if I'm disappointing myself, just imagine how far I'm falling short of what God wants of me. And you can get in this cycle of, of moralism where you think your value is determined by whether or not you meet your standards or God's standards, that eventually, like, religion starts feeling like slavery. It's just guilt. It's an impossible task. I'll never be good enough. Get it away from me. And the, the good news of the gospel, like the whole, the, the foundation of Christianity is God comes and says, you do fall woefully short. And yet, I love you so much, I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to live the perfect life, and then I'm going to give you my perfections. I'm going to go to the cross, and I'm going to suffer the penalty for all the ways that you really do fall short. And so now, I want you to walk around in the confidence that no matter what happens today, no matter how much you stumble, you're mine. You're infinitely loved. You're infinitely safe. You don't have to wake up and get back on the hamster wheel going, I got to be good enough, got to be good enough. And so today, this morning, what we're going to talk, and by the way, that has implications for everything you do. If you go through life and you come home and you think, man, to get my wife to love me, I've got to be good enough, got to be good enough, got to be good enough. Guess what your marriage is going to look like? Slavery. If you go to your God and you say, I've got to be good enough, got to be good enough, got to be good enough, guess what? You're going to fail just like you'll fail (laughs) as a husband. Slavery, parenting, slavery, work will be slavery. Like everything becomes slavery. It's just this never-ending wheel you can't get off of. And so you go back all the way to the beginning of God's covenant with his people of, of Israel. 1,400 years before Jesus is born, And God is taking his people out of Egypt. And what were they doing in Egypt? They were enslaved. Their whole identity, everything that they lived for was waking up and serving and serving and serving and serving. And and their only value was seen in what they could produce, how much they could produce. Every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. And they never got a break. And then God comes to them, and I want you to hear this. He says, I'm going to lead you out of slavery, out of this land of death and bondage. I'm going to give you a new future. I'm going to give you a new hope. And by the way, one of the first things I want you to do is stop working. On Sunday, I just want you to be with me. You're not allowed to work. Now think about what that means. If that's coming from God, that means that God does not value you based on what you do. That means God just wants you. That's kind of the whole point of the Sabbath. Stop working. Stop, stop striving. Stop trying to find your identity and your value and what you're doing. And just come be with me. Like, what does that say about the way that he sees you? It's pretty wild. And so I want to walk you through 
the one of the whole the the backstory behind the Exodus and everything that's going on when Moses comes out of Egypt and he goes to Mount Sinai and he gets all the law. One of the backstories behind that entire story is a big rebuke of all of Egypt, and that's what we're going to talk about. And right now you're going what? But I want you to see how much God does not like moralism. So the first thing that God does when he's bringing you, and you might find this in some of your own lives right now. This is certainly my story. But when I first came to faith, you know how God brought me to faith? He took everything else that I put my hope and trust in, all the things that I was looking to for my identity, and he went, smash. (laughs) Oh, money? Really? Smash. Your job? Oh, you find uh, titles, reputation? Smash. Your family? Oh, your dad disowned you for a season. Smash. To where like it was like, what do I have left to stand on? All right, I guess I'll, I've tried everything else, God. <laughs> I guess I'll give you a shot. You're, if you're going through a hard season right now, have you ever thought that it might be that God is taking away all your small G gods that run your life? Maybe he's smashing them to help you realize that you need to grab hold of the big G God. So what he does in Egypt, it's, it's a really beautiful thing. We're going to race through this. This is, this, this is worthy of its own class. But God says this, the whole reason why he pours out plagues on Egypt, did you, ever, did you ever hear this, that he says, I will bring judgment on who? The people of Egypt? No, he says, I'm going to bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. You want to know why he does the plagues? Because God wants the hearts of the Egyptians. Later, Earlier, he says, why is he doing it? So that the Egyptians will know that I'm the Lord. So when he pours out the plagues, he wants them to wake up and realize that all the small G gods that they're serving are garbage. And so let's race through the 10 plagues, and you'll get this real quick. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty simple, but it's crazy. So the first plague, he turns the Nile to blood. Now, the Egyptians believed that that green guy was one of their main gods named Osiris. They believed that the Nile River was literally the bloodstream of Osiris. And who's Osiris? Why do we care? Why does that matter? Well, Osiris was the god of resurrection, the afterlife. And so if you're an Egyptian and you know that there's a war going on between the Hebrew god Yahweh and the Egyptian gods, and now all of a sudden, the Nile River turns to blood. All of the Egyptians are going, oh my goodness, Osiris is coming to life. He's going to go fight against God. And what happens in the biblical story? All the Nile and all of the blood begins to rot, and the fish begin to die, and the river begins to stink, and all the water begins to stink. And if you're an Egyptian at that point, you're thinking, my God of the afterlife and the resurrection is dead. Then you get to the next plague, frogs. Oh no, not frogs, God. But they had a very sacred God called Hect. And Hect was the God of fertility, new life that comes into the world. So if you read the biblical story, it'll say the frogs came into their houses and their palaces and up into their beds. Well, why? Why does it tell you that the frogs are all over their beds? It seems kind of a weird thing to say, but it's telling you, a God of fertility, Hect is showing up. Hect is going to fight for us. And then what happens to all the frogs? They die, and the land begins to stink. And they go down in the ovens, and the penalty for killing a frog in Egypt, they were so sacred, was the death penalty. And so they can't eat because the frogs are just loaded into their ovens. So they can't drink, they can't eat. They've lost their hope of life everlasting. Now their God of new life in this world is gone. The land stinks, the the water stinks. Everything, God is just decimating the first two plagues. Then you get to the plague of lice, and you got the the ground, the the God of the, the ground, Geb, where Moses strikes the ground, and these gnats or lice come up, and they make it impossible to worship because they had cleanliness standards. Then dung beetles or flies. Well, why? Oh, no, not dung beetles. Well, the Egyptians worshipped a god, Kepri, that took the form of a scarab on his head, and they believed that this god literally rolled the sun across the sky like a dung beetle goes into a pile of poo and rolls a pile of poo, takes home for a snack later. And so now you've got, okay, Osiris is gone, and Hect is gone, and cleanliness standards, they can't worship, their priests are invalidated. Then you get Kepri, who's against them, and you go to the plague five, and all the livestock, boo, 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 they're all falling out, and Hathor's gone, and Hesat's gone, and Ta's gone, 
oh my goodness, like what Egyptian gods are left? And then come the boils and the plagues on health. Isis is gone and Thoth is gone and Sekhmet is gone. What gods do we have left, the Egyptians are thinking? His, their god is just decimating our gods and God is doing this to show them. God doesn't believe in the Egyptian gods, but he's mercifully wrecking their idols just like he mercifully wrecked my idols. Stop leaning on these things. They're powerless. They can't help you. Plague seven, hail and and lightning or, or fire from heaven, and you got Shu and Newt and Horus. All gods of the sky are weather. Then the next one comes and the locusts eat what the hail didn't destroy. And you've got Osiris and Hopi and Set that were all over the crops. And now those are gone. And it's like you look at the Egyptian pantheon and you're looking around like what God is left to fight for us. And the good news is for the Egyptians, their biggest God is still standing. Who's the Egyptians biggest God? Ra. What's he the God of? What's the ninth plague? darkness and he's just wiping out all their gods idol after idol after idol after idol and now there's one god left standing and it's pharaoh himself who the egyptians believed was a god right and god comes and says please turn let my people go otherwise what's going to happen it's the story of the passover And the Egyptians look, and their last god, Pharaoh himself, is powerless to save his son from death. And there's there's crazy things about the story, because what happens is it's not just a god up here who goes, I am powerful to make you all suffer these lessons. But I want you to remember, like, you you know how Ra gets, like, dies for three days? The sun goes black for three days? Does that sound familiar? A god dying for three days? Can you think of a God that would do that for you, maybe? Or the Passover, where Pharaoh's firstborn son dies so that the people of God can go free? Can you think of a reason why God might have ordained that story, foreshadowing what's to come when, when the father will give his son over to death for three days so that you can go free? from the land of death and bondage. God's writing poetry through all of this. And the the way that the Egyptians believed in the ancient world, so hang with me because here's where it might get confusing if you're not already there. The way that the Egyptians believed about the afterlife was fascinating. When an Egyptian would die, now you're going to feel like you're in class for a moment, but it's okay. When an Egyptian would die, he would think to himself, I, I'm entirely responsible for my ability to get to the afterlife. Entirely. So what's going to have to happen is when I'm dead, I have to have people that I trust well enough that are going to entomb my body, embalm my body. They're going to go into and take out what they believed were the essential organs of the day, which was like stomach, liver, intestines, and heart, I think. I might be wrong there. But they were like things that they left out. They would scoop out your brain with a hook and throw it away because they thought it was worthless. And they would put them in what are called these little canopic jars. And then they would put the canopic jars inside of a canopic chest. And they would put the canopic chest in this canopic chest inside a bigger canopic chest inside of a bigger canopic chest like Russian dolls. And the idea was if you don't preserve your body and it rots, then you lose your afterlife. You have to preserve yourself. And why would you seal it up and seal it up so that moisture can't get to it? And eventually you would take that and you would throw it into a a chest, usually a golden chest with this like jackal on top who's a god named Anubis. And Anubis's job was to walk you through, to guide you through the afterlife and to tell you everything that you needed to do to get to heaven. And so they would load this up and they would take it and they would carry it and notice that they weren't allowed to touch anything where Pharaoh's body was. They had to pull it on sleds with chains or hold it up with poles. They weren't allowed to touch it because if you ever touched where the God dwelled, you would be put to death. And so this is how they believed that their afterlife would go. This is called the Hall of Judgment. It's from the Book of the Dead, which is the Egyptians' Bible at the same time 
written a little bit before Moses. And so when they died, they believed, and I might be, I'm, might be messing this up, but here's, here's the dead guy, and here's Anubis, and he's holding this little circle thing with a key that looks like a cross. That's called Ankh. It means life. And so what he would do is he would lead them in, and up here you see where the dead guy is sitting in front of all those little check marks. Well, those check marks are gods. They look like they're sitting crisscross applesauce or something. And you see half of them are holding up, and they're, they're going, Unk, life. And then seven of them have yet to render a verdict, or they're not holding up the Unk. Well, then when that process is done, Anubis then leads you, and he takes you to the scales where your heart is measured up against the feather of truth, the ma'at. And if your heart is weighed down by sin, if you have a heavy heart, and it's heavier than a feather, then Amut gets to deal with you. And he's the dude with the the crocodile head and the the lion body and the hippo rump. And he's just waiting because if you fail, you're done. Like he's, he's got you. And if you ever read the Bible and you wonder, it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, that comes from a word kaved, which literally means to make heavy, dense. And so all of the Egyptians, when you hear God made Pharaoh's heart heavy, how would they have heard that? Making the heart heavy. It's bringing judgment on him. It's stubbornness, but it's like he's being weighed down. And once you make it beyond there, then you are... Put past Thoth, who's recording all of this, and Horus is going to lead you into the presence of Osiris, who is the god of the afterlife. And so now pause for a moment, because Egypt is the big bad empire. And I want you to, like, this is what the, the pharaoh or the deceased would have to say honestly to the gods of Egypt as he's reciting. And I want to see if you had a chance for Egyptian heaven. You ready? Here are 42 things that you had to be able to say. I have never transgressed. Everybody put up your hands and put them down when you're good. Like when you're out, all right? I have never transgressed the law. I'm out. All right? I've never stolen. I've never uttered lies. I've never committed adultery. I've never made anyone weep. I've never attacked any man. I've never been an eavesdropper. You forfeit eternity if you're nosy. I've never slandered any man. I've never been angry without just cause. Like, I do that every morning in traffic. I've never polluted myself. I've never shut my ears to the word of truth. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. La, 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 la. I've never stirred up strife. I've never acted in a hurry without a reason. I've never pried into matters. I've never multiplied my words trying to get out of something. I've never done any evil. I've never raised my voice. And then this one, I've never cursed God, and this one's my favorite. After you say all that stuff, (laughs) I've never acted with arrogance. Is there anyone in here who survived that gauntlet? No, not a chance, and we all know it. But in ancient Egypt, were they evil? No, they're actually teaching a very, very hard brand of moralism. What is this teaching you? You better be good enough. You better be able to stand before the gods and say, I've never done any of this stuff. And if you've ever done any of that stuff, you're gone. And so God leads them out from Egypt and he says, I've got a place that I want you to build for me. This is going to be where I dwell. And so you got to think when God is giving inside interior decorating tips and he's breaking out the architectural plans... The God of the universe is going to come dwell with his people. Like, we should pay attention to what the architecture's like. And so here's like a bad sketch of the tabernacle. And it's 30 cubits by 10 cubits. In other words, it's three by one. And in the last back room, that's the Holy of Holies, the gold area. That's where God dwells. And he dwells between the cherubim. So you had this gold box. Sound familiar? Anybody seen any gold boxes recently? And on top of that box, you have two angels. And God says, once a year, I want you to take the blood of a lamb, the blood of a sacrificial animal that's going to be slain for the sins of everyone else, and I want you to take that blood, come into my presence. Only once a year can you do this, and you're going to sprinkle blood in between those angels on 
the mercy seat on top of this golden box that's called the Ark of the Covenant. Once a year, and I dwell in that back room, the 10 cubit by 10 cubit, and the other two portions are left for the priests to be out front. And so when we went to Egypt, I went with Tom and Dr. Gage and probably some other people who are here. When we went into the Cairo Museum, like I saw all the golden boxes and it, it dawned on me like because they were like, this is acacia wood overlaid with gold. And I was like, that's exactly what the Ark of the Covenant is. Maybe there's something to that. And recently, like this is at the Battle of Kamesh. This is a recording of the Battle of Kamesh drawn up in Egyptian artwork. And I want you to look. This is the, the tent that went out on behalf of Pharaoh. And what this means, and it's pixelated, but it's a tent that's broken into three portions. The first two-thirds of the tent are set aside for the priests to worship. And the back room is reserved for two angels that are overlooking a cartouche of the name of Pharaoh who was a god. Now they were doing this prior to the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle design given by God. And so God is looking at this and he goes, no, 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 no. You want to see a better tent. And by the way, that hall of judgment that we were looking at, what is, how does that break down? It's broken down into threes, right? You've got three portions of this with the back portion being the God of resurrection. The last of the three is the God who gives you the thumbs up, the thumbs down, who determines your everlasting fate. There's Osiris. And so God comes after leaving this, and he says, no, 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 no. I'm going to give you a new tent. And this is what the tent's going to be. Out front, I want you to have an altar because something has to be slain for the sin of my people. What does that make you realize? I can't be good enough. Something has to be sacrificed to pay for my sins because I can never measure up, which we all know. And God's like, I want that out front. Then after that, after they recognize they can't get clean enough for me, then I want them to wash. In other words, your sins are taken care of before you get clean. You hear that? For those of you who are like, oh, Christianity, mm, I got to get clean first. No, again and again and again, God leads them out of Egypt before he gives them the law. He says to them, you're mine, before he gives them the Ten Commandments. He makes them sacrifice and acknowledge that they're a sin so that their sin can be taken care of before he gives them the ability to clean up. If you sit around waiting to be good enough for God before you give your life to him, it'll never happen. You'll never be there. I've been, I've been a Christian for 20... Well, I'm still not there. Won't be till glory. And so they go from the sacrifice, then they go to the bronze laver where they wash up, then they go into this tent that we saw. Oop, one too many. And they come and he says, I want you to put bread out there. Why? Because God is the one who satisfies. These are all emblems of what he provides. And he says, I want you to put a lampstand because I'm the one who gives light. I'm the one who helps people to see in the darkness. Then he gives them this altar of incense. And it's to remind you of prayers going up because he is the one who answers prayers. And so we get to that back room. And remember what the Egyptians saw? Like, this is where Pharaoh put all of his hope. This is where the Egyptians put all of their hope, all of their body, their organs, and everything else inside these chests. And on top of it was the symbol of Anubis that said, I'm going to lead you into everlasting life. Anubis is important. He's all over the place on these things. So when God comes and he says, no, 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 I want you to build for me an acacia wood box. I don't want Anubis on it. I want two angels. And I want the two angels with their wings outstretched, and I want them looking at the place where the blood gets sprinkled. And God's like, that's what I want you to base your hope of resurrection and eternity on. And you're going, what in the world? Then God says, inside that box, I don't want your liver, I don't want your heart, I don't want your intestines, I don't want anything of you. But in that box, I want Ten Commandments. 
the stone tablets, God's covenant with man. And what happened to the Ten Commandments? It's the word of God that came down from heaven. Remember when Moses is on the mountain and he comes down and he confronts the sin of the people and he's like, they're worshiping the golden calf and what does Moses do? He destroys the Ten Commandments. He throws them down and shatters them and then God says they're going to be made new and he brings back new tablets. What do you hear in that? The word of God comes down, confronts the sin of the people and the word of God is destroyed and resurrected and made new. What is Jesus called? He's the Word. The Word made flesh. You mean the Word of God came down from heaven, confronted the sin of the people, and He was smashed and made new? And God's like, I want that in my ark. That's a picture of what's going to save my people. Oh, and then Aaron's rod. It's where all of Israel comes to the high priest of Israel and says, You're a dirtbag. We want a new high priest. You don't measure up. You're terrible. And God says, Okay, we'll settle this. Everybody from all the tribes, you you bring me one staff from each of your tribes, and the one that I pick is going to blossom. Now, they're dead sticks. This doesn't make sense. Dead sticks don't come to life, and yet in the morning, Aaron's rod blossoms with almonds. Why would God want that in his ark? What is he saying? I am the one who takes dead things And unworthy things like Aaron, the high priest, who really didn't deserve that job. And yet God shows up and says, I'll bring life there. I'll bring resurrection. I want that inside the box because I'm a God of mercy. And then lastly, the manna, the jar of manna. What is manna? It's bread that rains down from heaven. But God says every day, at the end of every day, it's going to go away. And if you try to grab too much of it, it's going to rot and perish in your hands. It's going to get infested. So what do you hear there? Manna dies every day. It perishes and it rots unless it's in the presence of God. Then all of a sudden, that which is perishable never dies. And so God, when he gives the the tabernacle and the ark, he's saying to Egypt, which is like, you've got to be good enough, you've got to be good enough, you've got to be good enough, you've got to be good enough. Right out of the gates, God is going, it is not about you. It is not about you. It is my power to make the dead come to life that represents people that are utterly unworthy of me. It's not about you. I can take things that are perishing daily and make them live forever in my presence. It's not about you. I am the word that is resurrected with power to bring a covenant with my people that will never break And then the most glorious part of this whole thing, Dr. Gage is the one who showed me this, because if you ever read the Gospel of John, it's it's an architectural blueprint for the whole tabernacle. It's amazing. But I want you to remember the Egyptian box with Anubis on top. What does Anubis represent? Remember? Oh, I'm going to lead you in the path to eternity. This is how you get everlasting life. Come with me. And God says, no. And he gives them a golden box, with two angels on top surrounding the place where the blood of atonement was shed. 1,400 years before Jesus is born, God gives this design to his people. And it's prophetic of something amazing, guys. God is saying, you want to know how you can have everlasting life. It's not Anubis. And he gives the Ark of the Covenant. And this is what the Gospel of John says how it closes when it's talking about the resurrection. I want you to hear this and tell me what it's talking about. So the morning of the resurrection, Mary runs to Peter and John. They hear the resurrection. They race to the tomb. Don't read it yet. John and Peter race to the tomb. They run inside the tomb, and they don't see anything. They just see folded linens on the ground, and that was pretty profound. Why is that profound? Here we go. Ready? Because it's telling you something. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, if you're, if you're Jewish, you know what that is. It's the Day of Atonement. The high priest would go inside the temple, and he would have changed his clothes five times throughout this. And it's the day where he gets to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, and it gives forgiveness of sin for all of Israel. At the end of that, he would take off his outer garment, which was white, 
and he would fold it up neatly. Leviticus 17 says that he was to leave those clothes folded up neatly on the floor and then walk out of the Holy of Holies where the forgiveness of sins was happening. And so when Peter and John run in and they see nothing but the folded linens, what is it telling you? A high priest has just done his work. A high priest has just sprinkled the blood that has given forgiveness for everyone else. And, but they don't see Jesus. They don't see the risen Lord. They're going, this is really weird. And they leave. But still outside is a woman who's utterly shameful. She's a demoniac, former demon-possessed woman, probably a prostitute, shameful past. She's outside, and she is just weeping. And this is what the scriptures tell us. The disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and what does she see? She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. What is she seeing? She's seeing the ark. 1,400 years before Jesus, God says, I want this piece of furniture in the holy of holies where only I dwell because this image is just glorious to me. It's all I need in my room. 1,400 plus years later, God sends his son into the world to take up your sins and to pay for them, to give you his righteousness, to keep his promise. And you want to know how you get eternal life? Mary Magdalene looks into an empty tomb and she sees an angel here, She sees an angel here and the blood on the linens that gave forgiveness of sin to all the world in between. What is she looking at? It's the ark. Do you know what that means? Like you ever hear, oh, the God of the Old Testament, he was mean, but Jesus is really nice. No, the God of the Old Testament is painting the good news of what he plans to do for his people from 1,500 years plus before Jesus is ever born. God is looking at the resurrection and he's like, that image is so precious to me. And why is it so precious to me? Because that's the moment where the Messiah comes into this world and conquers sin, and conquers death, and frees his people so that God can say of you, if you're in Christ, you're mine forever. And every other identity, and every other idol, and every other slavery that has claimed you is destroyed and defeated. You are mine, I've paid the penalty. And he decorates his living room with the image of the defeat of death that Christ will do. So when he's leaving Egypt, back to this whole point of why I'm talking about this, what is Egypt? Do better, do better, do better, do better, do better, do better. And God comes and just smashes all their idols. And he takes them out and he says, you want the hope of everlasting life. Here it is. It's found in the resurrection. It's found in atonement for sin. And now you come to a God who does that for the joy set before him, the scriptures say. What's the joy? You are. And he decorates all of history. He decorates his living room with the image that wins you. Do you know how precious you are to God? Like we think, you know, we decorate our houses with all kinds of things to remind us of God or scripture verses or whatever. Do you know that God decorated his living room The only thing that he wanted in there was a picture of your redemption. That's how much you mean to him. It's just awesome. So if your idols are getting smashed, see it as the kindness of God. He's trying to get you to realize that he alone can satisfy. All the other stuff is just going to leave you empty and slavish. Come to him and recognize that he alone accomplishes your redemption. And that should make you so grateful of a God who loves you that much that you go, I'll do whatever you want. Obedience is yours. You're that good. Amen?